Hello, everybody. Hello. Nice to see you all this evening. Welcome, welcome. Big round of applause to uh, Kathy and her crew for the wonderful dinner. Yay. Hope you were able to enjoy it. It sure looked good. And uh, if you act fast, there's still some cookies and strawberries and stuff over there. So, you know, he who hesitates is lost. So keep that in mind. Uh, so good to have you all here. Uh, we are continuing in our uh, discussion on the Gospel of Mark. Welcome to our online community. We're grateful to have uh, uh, those good folks joining us. Uh, if you can imagine this group times, I don't know, maybe three or four um, is, are the folks that are watching this uh, from the comfort of their own homes or at a time that is more convenient for them than uh, Wednesday evening. So we're grateful that uh, technology brings us all together. And, um, and don't think that you get more gold stars because you came here uh, at, uh, for, for the end. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Yeah, now you're going to get up and leave. So um, no, you got a good dinner. That's, that's the big benefit. But no, we, we certainly do. And I would reach out to our online community to welcome you to come and join us. Uh, if you have the chance, because you get to see all these wonderful people, right? And uh, also, we get to uh, experience some fellowship together, and, and that's a good thing. Um, it's always good when the body of Christ gathers together in person. Um, and I know that that's something that will continue to um, challenge everybody on, especially as we develop new patterns and you know, and the convenience of staying home and watching. Um, and again, that's no mark against anybody that does that. But at the same time, we certainly do um, gain something by being together uh, in person with one another. So we uh, always encourage you to be thinking that way uh, throughout the week and on Sunday morning. I better pray. So let's pray. We are grateful, oh God, for your presence with us this night, or whenever it is that we uh, are um, viewing this teaching, we are grateful that you connect us by your Holy Spirit, whether we are together or apart, and thankful that the body of Christ works its way in so many ways in our time. We are grateful for your word, for, um, for this good gospel, and for the uh, word revealed to us through your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will give us open minds and hearts that this story may become for us a, a story for our own lives so that we can draw closer to you. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, uh, several people asked uh, tonight, uh, how far are we going to get tonight? Um, <laughs> I, I know I have lowered the bar significantly. It took us three weeks to get through one chapter. Um, and I promise that we will kind of pick up the pace a little bit. Um, but we don't want to necessarily um, uh, um, avoid the opportunity we have to go deeper into some of these texts and to wonder what gold is to be found there. Um, you know, good, a good gold miner doesn't do things quickly. A uh, good gold miner takes the time to get into the, into the depths of the earth in order to find those veins of gold. So that's what we'll always be on the lookout for. We are um, starting in the second chapter of Mark tonight, and we um, we'll kind of see things shift here from chapter 1 to chapter 2, and I'll talk about that for a moment, in, in a moment. Uh, but a, another sort of analogy came to me this week when I was doing the study for Mark 2. Um, you, you'll recall that in Mark 1, there's this voice that in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and so some, something's happening. God is on his way. And, uh, and then, of course, Jesus appears uh, at the Jordan River and is baptized by John. 
and he uh, undergoes his testing uh, in the wilderness. And then from there, he begins to uh, recruit people for uh, this great mission of uh, the Messiah. And, uh, and then we sort of had a chance to take a look at a day in the life of Jesus in Capernaum and his healing and uh, his uh, interactions with the, uh, the synagogue leaders uh, and his healing of, the, of, the, um, of, of those who were handicapped. Uh, and, uh, and, and through it all, what we're beginning to see is the, the opening scenes of this uh, advance of God into the world. It makes me think, uh, you know, I've I got to drop C.S. Lewis in here at some point, so it makes me think of uh, that great series of the Chronicles of Narnia that Lewis wrote, and uh, that first story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. How many of you have ever read or seen the movie of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Excellent. Um, you do get a gold star for that, I just want you to know. Uh, but The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe begins, right, with these uh, children entering into Narnia. And uh, when, they, uh, when they enter into Narnia, what they discover is that Narnia is, uh, is within the clutches of the, the White Witch, right? There's the, the evil one has uh, taken control of Narnia, and in Narnia, uh, it's uh, always winter, never Christmas. That's, what, uh, that's how it's described in that great story, that uh, those characters that are a part of Narnia, those animals and other, uh, other creatures that are part of Narnia, are experience endless winter, but never Christmas. And, uh, but uh, as we begin to see the story unfold, what we learn is Aslan is on the move. Aslan is that, the great lion who, uh, you know, in many respects serves as the Christ figure who has made his advance in, back into Narnia in order to reclaim Narnia for the emperor beyond the sea, who is the, the God figure, God the, God the Father. And what you see as the story unfolds, is that winter begins to recede. And, uh, and, and in the recession of winter uh, comes great threat to the powers that are trying to keep winter always uh, a part of Narnia. And, um, <clears throat> but Aslan is on the move, and winter is beginning to recede, and a new creation is beginning to form. A new day is beginning to dawn in Narnia because Aslan is on the move. Well, I think of that when I think of these opening chapters of Mark because in a sense what we're seeing is Aslan is on the move. We're seeing you know, that the kingdom of God, as Jesus preaches in Mark 1, is at hand, that the kingdom is making its way into the world. And in Mark 1, we get all these wonderful stories where people are very, very receptive to this advancing kingdom. You know, sick people are being healed. Disciples are being called. There is this sense of this compelling, uh, wonderful, life-giving force is on its way, and people are being drawn to it. They're, they're saying, I want more of that. The, the sick want more of that. The, the, these young disciples, these fishermen, want more of that. They, they are compelled to drop their nets and follow this, this, um, this rabbi who appears to have uh, something about him that people feel that they want to connect to. And, um, and so, and, and it's described often, even in chapter 1, that he, he teaches as one who has, can you maybe end that sentence? Authority. authority. He teaches as one who has authority. And so they're drawn to this. But what happens in all this kind of story is that uh, there, there is this draw, this people are paying attention, people feel inclined, but then there are those who don't like the advance. There are those that want to 
want to push back. There are those that are threatened by the new regime. And so that's what we're going to find in Mark chapter 2. We're going to, this is sort of the backdrop for these stories that we read in Mark 2, are the, are the, is the pushback. And you, you know, we're not surprised to see that largely the pushback comes from those who have control of the former regime. Right? You know, those that are in control of the former regime very seldom say, oh, look at this. Another way of doing things. Isn't this great? Come on in. You know, here, have my office. Um, no, there's pushback. And that's what we're going to experience in, uh, in Mark chapter 2. So um, let's take a look at the first story. <clears throat> and the first story begins in verse 1 and goes through verse 12. So if you have your Bibles, um, I invite you to follow along and Again, I'll repeat that it's okay if your translation sounds a little bit different than mine. Um, it actually makes the whole thing richer because uh, we have different nuances of the English language. And uh, it's important to kind of you know, get a feel for the expanse of what is being, uh, what is, uh, the expanse of what is held in the original language. So I'll read the, the first uh, 12 verses. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, you remember Capernaum was the home base of Jesus, not Nazareth, not Jerusalem, not Bethlehem, Capernaum, little fishing village right on the coast of the Sea of Galilee, right on the northern shore. Um, these days, Capernaum is not right on the shore because lots of things have happened to topographically over the last 2,000 years. So. The waters have receded, and, um, and so Capernaum is pretty far back. I don't know exactly how far back, but I'm guessing maybe a mile or so. Um, but in that day, Capernaum was sitting right there on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> so he returns to Capernaum after some days. It was reported that he was at home. Interesting, where's home? Uh, didn't we read somewhere that Jesus doesn't have a home? Um, so we're inclined to think uh, that uh, Jesus' home was the home of Peter and his family. Remember, we learned that Peter had um, a wife. We know he had a wife because he had a mother-in-law. And um, usually mother-in-laws come with wives, so just so you know that. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's likely where Jesus resided, uh, is in Peter's home. So he's at home. Uh, so many gathered around. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And Jesus was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, oh, why does this fellow speak in this way? This is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And at once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise these questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Jesus is in the home of Peter, likely Peter and Andrew. And, um, and he uses that as the, his place of teaching. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a surprise to find a rabbi situated in someone's home. And what we're hearing here is something important for the early church. Remember, Mark is writing this 
uh, for the purposes of the early church. And where did the early church gather? In homes. So they are encouraged to hear that Jesus is teaching from a home, that Jesus is continuing to teach from home, from in homes. It's something hard for us to sort of get our minds around because, you know, we go to church to hear Jesus teach. We go to church to hear Jesus preach. Um, but in 70 AD, when this was being written, likely, uh, these people are gathering in homes, and they're eager to hear about the teachings of Jesus. And so that's the context of this experience that's happening in Capernaum. Jesus is gathered in a home, and he's speaking the word to them, and his speaking the word to them draws people, that Jesus' teaching is compelling enough that people are very eager to hear, so eager to hear that not only do they fill the house, but they fill that to capacity, and now they've got a crowd outside the house trying to strain to listen in to what Jesus has to say. It's kind of like Sunday morning at Church of the Palms, right? So um, they're straining in to hear what Jesus has to say, because he is bringing to them a new word, an authoritative word, a word likely that is relevant to their lives. This guy is talking about us. He's addressing us. He's seeking to, he's seeking to bring the kingdom to us, and that draws them uh, to hear what Jesus has to say. So as he's doing this, this really crazy thing happens, right? These four men have a friend who is, who is paralyzed. He's not able to walk. And these four men bring this, this paralytic uh, carrying the four corners of his mat, and they need to get this guy in to see Jesus. They need to get him to the source of the healing. I love these four guys. Oh, I assume they're guys. Maybe not. But I love these guys. They love their friend so much that they were willing, they're willing to carry the four corners of his mat, and they're willing to not let heaven and earth get in the way of them taking gain their friend before Jesus. So much so that not only do they, you know, you know, uh, attempt to make their way through this crowd of people, but eventually they get creative uh, and they make their way to the top of the house. Um, first century Palestinian homes often had stairwells that, walked, that were up the side of the house, um, sometimes to get into the second level. So they carry this guy up and they get on top of the roof, likely a you know some type of a straw thatch, you know, maybe um, you know, put together with some, t some type of bonding agent, mud, whatever that kind of holds it together. That's as much of a roof as they had. Um, they didn't have, you know, the uh, Spanish uh, roofs that we have here in Florida. Um, um, their, their roofs are cheaper than ours uh, here in Florida. So. Um, and so while Jesus is teaching, I, can you imagine being in the crowd and all of a sudden you hear this, you know, <clears throat> they're digging through the roof of the house. And, uh, and then lo and behold, they lower this guy down in front of Jesus. And, um, and one can only imagine that uh, Jesus, uh, that these men are doing this uh, for what purpose? They want Jesus to heal this guy, right? We want him to heal this guy. And because they believe that he can do that. And Jesus applauds their faith, says, you know, he, what's the verse that says here? Um, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, and here comes the big surprise, he says to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
He went, no, 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 no. That's not what we brought the guy for. We didn't get to bring the guy for his sins to be forgiven. We brought him so that he could walk again. Now, that's, that's an interesting place to kind of pause, to reflect upon, um, and, and there's a lot to unpack here, which I will get to in a minute, but just pause there in terms of what expectations we have of Jesus. Jesus, I need to be healed. Oh, and by the way, I have a very specific idea as to how I need to be healed. You know, I've got bursitis. I've got, you know, um, you know uh, I just re received a diagnosis, whatever the case may be. And Jesus, I need you to intervene. And oh, by the way, I know exactly what it is I need you to do. And that's what these four men, you know, the interesting thing about this story is we hear nothing from the paralyzed man. We actually hear, hear nothing from the four men either, the, the guys that have carried the mat. Um, so so there's, there's no specific request that's made. It's just that the, this man has been lowered before Jesus. Um, and, but one can only imagine why they do this, because they want their, their, their friend to be healed of his paralysis. But Jesus instead says, your sins are forgiven. And it makes me wonder about what our expectations of Jesus are when we go to Jesus with our petition, uh, either for others or for ourselves. Oftentimes we get so disappointed in our prayers because of the specific thing that we're asking of Jesus and maybe not necessarily wanting to understand that there may be something else that needs to be healed. Your sins are forgiven. Um, now, we're not here to judge whether Jesus thinks that it his sins being forgiven is the primary healing necessary for his life. Um, it doesn't say that in the text, but it's certainly the first thing that Jesus goes toward is his sin. So when we think about our own prayer life and think about our petition to God, one of the questions is, are we open to how God wishes to intervene in our lives? Or are we closed to anything beyond what we've asked for? There's a lot of healing that God wants to do, I think, in our lives that may have very little to do with the healing we think we want. Sometimes God is willing to heal the thing we need, um, but we close ourselves off to that because we only want the healing that we think we we need. So there's, a, there's an interesting thing that's going on here that might inform us in terms of our own encounter, our own expectations of what Christ can do in our lives. You know, frankly, one of the other things to pay attention to is that while Jesus is doing lots of physical healing and he continues to do so, especially in the first half of Mark, um, it may very well be that the, the healing he's most concerned about doing is bringing forgiveness to us, to free us from whatever guilt or shame or whatever it is that in our life that is actually probably having greater havoc in us than maybe those physical concerns that we, that we have. And, and the truth is, the truth is that there will always be we will, we will all die from something that won't, um, won't eventually be healed, right? You know, we're all going to pass away. It looks like a surprise statement to some of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? Jeez. Um, there's, there's always, there's going to be something, you know, obviously not to take into account you know, things that happen externally to us that have nothing to do with illness. There are those things that happen as well. But, but that 
for most of us, we die from something physical that has not been healed, right? Cancer, you, um, you know, heart conditions, you name it. Um, so it may make sense to us that the thing that Jesus is most concerned about healing is our sin, our brokenness, right? Because in the end of the, at the end of the day, that's really what's going to matter most at the end of things, because we all are going to die physically. But how are we, how are we um, doing spiritually? How are we doing with our own sense of being and our relationship with God and our own sense of shame and guilt and all those things that can often put even greater barriers to our relationship with God than the physical. And believe me, I do not take lightly the physical. I get it. There's great physical maladies that are, have a great effect upon our own spirit and our own emotion and our own being. Uh, and yet, at the end of the day, when it comes to our being forgiven, um, that is, at the end of the day, the thing that keeps us most connected with God. So, um, so there are the religious authorities sitting there listening to Jesus in the house, and they hear this guy get, speak, you know, speak up and say, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, what the heck? Who's this? Who, who's this that says that your sins are forgiven? I mean, what position... I mean, one, it would be one thing if somebody, if this guy had harmed Jesus, and then for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven, well, that makes all the sense of the world because that's the role of the one who's, been, who's the victim, right? To be given the opportunity to extend grace and to say, I forgive you. So that makes all the sense in the world. But this guy, who's got nothing to do with what this guy has done, all of a sudden stands before him and says, I have the authority to forgive your sins. And people are saying, that doesn't make sense. So we understand the reaction of the authorities that are sitting there in the house when they say, now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts, what does this fellow speak in this way? Is it blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they kind of get what's happening. Once Jesus perceived in the spirit that they were discussing these questions, and then he goes on to say, why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. So there's, there we go. That's your cue to check your phones. Um, so um, Jesus, then understanding something that is important to understand, the idea of the, having the authority to forgive sins is an intangible, right? To say, for me to say, you know, for me to stand up here before you and say, um, Judy, your sins are forgiven. Um, first of all, you would be looking at me thinking, Steve's been working too hard and he, a little Messiah complex here and, you know, and, and, and beyond that, you would say to yourself, well, how do I know that that's true? How do I know that her sins are forgiven? How does Judy even know that her sins are forgiven? Just because I said so? I mean, how do, how do, we, make, how do we find any proof in that? So Jesus says, uh-huh. So what's it easier to do, forgive a person's sins? or to tell him to get up and walk. So he turns to the paralytic and says, okay, we'll give them something tangible. We'll show them who has authority. We'll show them who has power. And he turns to the paralytic and says, stand up, take your mat, and walk. And the man does. And now all of a sudden, we have this dilemma in front of people, most people grateful because it says at the end of the story, um, they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. But for those who are kind of holding on to the old regime, this is a threat, right? This is like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
this guy's this guy can forgive sins. He can he can heal people. Ooh, this isn't good. I mean, we got a new sheriff in town, right? So, um, so what we see in this story is that um, this this movement of the kingdom is making its advance, and not only is God, Jesus exhibiting the authority to for, uh, to heal, but he is at the same time exhibiting authority to forgive. And furthermore, he calls himself the son of man in this story. And, um, you know, all of a sudden when Jesus says the son of man, referring to himself, everybody's ears perk up, especially those who know their Bible um, in that little house, and they know that Son of Man refers back to Daniel, Daniel the prophet, where the great vision is, uh, is, is shared, which says, I saw one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient One, which is God, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one. So when I said the new sheriffs in town, that's what they're hearing when they hear Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man. And, and believe me, this is what starts Jesus getting into real trouble. Because he is now, he is now um, pointing to himself as someone much larger than just a local Palestinian rabbi teaching in the local synagogue. Jesus is suggesting Aslan is on the move. And it's, it's really, you know, when you think about it, it's, it's really kind of um, startling, and it is, there's just great gravity given to what is happening in this little town. And, and we can't forget this, that all this is happening in this little village, right? It's not like Jesus, you know, stood on the steps of the, you know, uh, the Roman palace of Caesar and announces all this. This is all happening very local. All religion is local. It's as local as this little room here. It's as local as this little church here. This is where the kingdom gets its start. It happens in this little village. And uh, Jesus is beginning to announce that Aslan is on the move and things are beginning. And the, the other thing I want to just touch on, because it will immediately uh, appear again in the next story, is that um, there is this, um, it's almost like a resurrection scene. Because what's happened is this paralytic man being, held, being, being carried on this mat, has been lowered. It's almost like he's being lowered into a grave. Being lowered before Jesus. And Jesus forgives his sins and gives him the power to rise. There's a, this is a resurrection. Because in a very real sense, this paralytic man has, has already got a foot in the grave, right? Because there's so little that can be done with him. There's so little that he can do. But Jesus raises him from the dead. You know, in John's Gospel, we have Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. But we have, in a very real sense, Jesus raising this man to new life. Um... And maybe what he's being raised from is not just his physical being, but he's being raised from whatever the guilt and shame of his life. Your sins are forgiven. When we say that in the traditional service, some of it also here in the contemporary service, we call it the assurance of forgiveness or the assurance of pardon. We confess our sin and we hear the assurance of our forgiveness. In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. That's a resurrection moment. It's the resurrection for the people of God. It's the resurrection for the Easter people that we have. We are being raised every Sunday. 
from all the guilt and all the shame and all the things that you know, make us think that we are not worthy of God's love or that we are not, you know, that we, we can't ever be forgiven because God can't forgive these things in my life. Whatever it might be, childhood stuff, stuff going on in your life right now, that when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, you are raised to new life. Wow, I mean, this is amazing stuff. If, in fact, it's true, right? So that's where the conflict is. There's some that say, oh, this guy, mm -mm. And, you know, we got to find a way to get rid of this guy because he's saying crazy things. But there are others that are being drawn toward it. If you're interested to have grace in your life, this is the one you're drawn toward, right? If you're interested in, you know, just learning, you know, how to be a good or bad, you know, how to be a better person, eh, Jesus may not be your guy. Not to say he doesn't teach us how to be a better person, but, you know, that journey is difficult if you don't have it, you don't have with you grace, if grace doesn't accompany that, because we never get it all right. We never get it perfect. I, I know some of you are surprised at that, but, you know, but, but we never get it all right. But, um, but by grace, we are given the opportunity to rise up to a new chapter of our lives. I've covered 12 verses. I thank you, Jesus. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So let's go to the next resurrection scene. Verses 13 through and 14. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them. Jesus keeps teaching, keeps teaching, keeps teaching. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And Levi got up. Levi stood up. Could have stayed seating, could have stayed seated. Could have remained in his, tax, in his little toll booth, because that's really what, what you know, um, in, in Galilee, the way that Romans collected taxes was not as much with a poll tax because these were, um, you know, these were not Roman citizens, uh, but through um, a passage tax. Basically, if you want to cross this river, you got to pay a tax. If you want to, you know, take this road from point A to point B, you got to pay. It's what you know. It's, it's Sun Pass, <laughs> right? It's, it's sort of the. Um, uh, the ancient version of Sun Pass. If you want to get over the Skyway Bridge, you know, you got to pay your, uh, you got to have your Sun Pass mark, you know, and you got to pay the government for that to happen. Um, so Jesus, uh, so, so uh, Levi is, uh, has, uh, is a Jew, got a Jewish name, Levi. Uh, other Gospels call this person Matthew, but Mark calls him Levi. No surprise that Matthew calls him Matthew. Um, but this is Levi. And Levi is a good, you know, is, is of Jewish descent. And he has conspired with Rome. We talked about tax collectors last week. He has conspired with Rome in order to not only collect poll, uh, um, uh, um, tolls from the people, but to ex um, extort the people in the collecting of the tolls. They say, hey, well, not only do you owe a quarter, but I need to put on my quarter too. So I get a quarter, Rome gets a quarter, and you can go. And if you don't like it, then you don't go. So uh, you can imagine Levi is not you know, the most favorite you know, guy in town. And Jesus comes to him, and his, he, he, is, he is seeking to Give him a new life. Follow me. You were once here. You were once dead. I'm seeking to make you alive. You were once lost. I'm seeking to make you found. Follow me. And Levi, like Peter and Andrew and James and John, Levi rises and says, I will follow you. So there's a resurrection that comes when we make a commitment to this rabbi, right? There's, 
So it's not just our sins are being forgiven, but we are responding to the call to begin to live as Jesus lived, that we are being liberated from uh, our past. So that story then moves into another story involving Levi. As Jesus sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the scribes of the Pharisees, these are the ones who not only transcribed the law, but also were in the place of, of interpreting the law, when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Oh boy. Oh boy, this is the new regime, right? This is the new regime, because the old regime is you got to be righteous if you're going to be a part of the regime. And, you know, too bad for you if you don't follow our rules or you don't follow Torah in the way that we want you to follow Torah. You see, what's happening throughout Jesus' ministry is this dialogue he's having between himself and the uh, interpreters of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, we'll see later, the Herodians. These are people, they're all trying to understand what does Torah, how does it guide us? Torah, you know, is the first five books of, the, of our uh, Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was the source of the law. That was, you know, the, the people of God are trying to understand what does Torah say to us in terms of how we live and what we can expect of God. And so now there comes this issue around what does Torah mean or what does Torah say about how we engage those who are not followers of Torah, are not, are not in line with our interpretation of Torah. And here's Jesus hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners, and the scribes of the Pharisees look at him and say, ah, mm -mm, sorry, pal, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about because he's hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. And what Jesus is doing, not only by word, but also by deed, is he is exhibiting a new interpretation of Torah. He's showing a different teaching, a new teaching, one that is compelling to those who feel that they have been excluded from the interpretation of Torah. That's the great thing about laws. You can interpret them a million different ways, and you can usually find someone who will interpret them your way. Right? Or we often will interpret you know, the norms of society in the way that most benefits us and our kind. Um, so Jesus is busting that all open. And not only is he, you know, not only is he teaching new interpretations of Torah, he is now living it out and he is participating in this banquet with Levi, the tax collector, and he's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, all those unrighteous people. And what's happening is we're getting a vision, and here's a new phrase for you to remember, again, to impress your friends wherever you might go, you know, so just to throw this phrase out. Um, but in a sense, what's happening is what's called the S, oh boy, you're going to be so impressive with this one, the eschatological, isn't that a great word? Eschatological banquet. What does that mean? I should spell it first. Anyone know what eschatological means? Woo! E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, eschatological. 
Anybody want to take a crack at that one? Oh, Doris, good for you. I'll repeat Doris's answer. Dealing with the end times. Dealing with the end times. Give Doris a big round of applause. I'll tell you. Excellent. So it's not a stretch that Jesus is showing what the banquet will look like at the end of it all. This is the way it's going to look when it's all over. It's going to be a gathering of everybody. The, you know, the greatest of all the sinners and the greatest of all the saints are all going to be together, and they're going to be feasting on the same meal. It is what we suggest we are doing in communion, right? Communion is a reenactment, not a reenactment, it is an enactment of what we anticipate to be the eschatological banquet. <laughs> uh, how it all going to look when, we, when the whole thing comes to an end, it's going to re be revealed and, oh my gosh, we've all come together. And uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to experience this. Um, and it's, uh, we, we showed this movie during God in Hollywood uh, years ago. And uh, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, which will probably give you a reason not to watch it. So, but um, <laughs> some of you have seen it. I know Places in the Heart. How many of you have seen Places in the Heart? Okay, a few of you. Good, good. It's got a great cast, Sally Field, John Malkovich, Danny Glover. I mean, it's a great movie. <gasps> and... It has an eschatological banquet. <laughs> and it doesn't say it, but it's there. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not even going to tell you where it is. But if you watch it this week, uh, I'm going to try to remember to ask you about it next week. Okay. Um, places in the heart. Google it. You can, you know, you can probably find it on YouTube somewhere. I mean, you know, it's, it's been around long enough. Um, uh, or you can, you know, find it on some streaming service, I'm sure. Um, you know, Netflix or whatever it probably has it. I know it, they did have it a few years ago when we watched it for God in Hollywood. But <clears throat> eschatological banquet is in the middle of this movie. And... Um, I remember when I watched it for the first time, it, it took my breath away. So, you know, I'm really selling this thing, aren't I? You know? And I get no royalties from this movie, I just want you to know. But um, I really encourage you to watch it. So there they are. They're participating in the eschatological banquet because Levi has been raised. And everybody else is being raised. And now they get together as the raised ones. They have been brought from an old life to a new life because they are in the midst of the presence of Jesus. They are with the Messiah, the one who forgives sins, the one who has authority to forgive sins. Wow. I mean, think about that. You know, we so often get sidetracked in the church about all these little, you know, pesky little things and, you know, is this the right thing or is this the wrong thing or is this the right blah, 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 blah. And did, did I like that hymn or did I not like that hymn or you know, did I like that sermon, did I not like that sermon, blah, 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 blah. The truth of the matter is, can, you know, could we imagine that when we gather together, even on Wednesday night dinners, that that could be an <laughs> eschatological <laughs> banquet? Wow, that, that this, is, this is what we have to look forward to. The, the people of God coming together, not as, well, oh, aren't you lucky I showed up in church today. <laughs> Instead, to say, I get to be here. I get to be at the banquet. I get to be at the banquet because I, too, have been raised. I, too, have been delivered from my sin. I, too, have been healed in whatever ways by which God has chosen to heal me, and I get to be here. Wow. I mean, it's a whole different way of understanding what it means to be a part of, uh, the, a part of the church. 
Um, so, boy, I'm, you know, geez, 17 verses into it. Um, and then lastly, you know, Jesus sort of identifies himself as the physician, um, that, that Jesus is the physician. He has come not to uh, minister to the righteous, but to those who are sick. Uh, he's the physician. He's the doctor. Which is interesting to think about in terms of our own mission, our own decision to follow Jesus. Jesus is going to take us to places that um, put us at risk. This, you know, good doctors are not, you know, good, a good doctor doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't attend you because you're sick. You know, because I might catch something if I take care of you. You know, the Hippocratic Oath is that, you know, you, you serve, you, you know, you, and you certainly don't, you know, perpetuate death, you do what you can to attend to the, the healing needs of those that you are being called to. Well, in a very real sense, if we follow the great physician, we are making our way into the ills of society and putting ourselves at risk of um, becoming victims of, that, of the ills of society. You know, way down the road here, we'll see Jesus on the cross. That's what happens to the great physician, right? He's seeking to address the ills of society, and this is what happens. So there's great risk that we uh, take when we decide to follow um, when we decide to follow Jesus. Okay. Hmm. Let's go a few more verses. Whew. Verse 18, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to them, said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, the wedding guests come fast, cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have bri the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and the worst tear is made. And as one puts new wine into an old wine skins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost. And so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The, disciples, the Pharisees said to him, look, what they're, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Um, I'm only going to be able to touch on these verses, and we'll come back to them next time, but I want to be able to say at the end of this that I did a whole chapter, okay? So, uh, that, um, like I said, I'm going to cheat and come back to it uh, next time because there's, there's a lot here to unpack. But, uh, but there's, there are two, and I'm going to leave it at this, there are two um, disciplines, spiritual disciplines that Jesus is engaging here um, that are brought to him out of concern by those who feel like they are the um, they are the rulers of discipline, right? They are the ones who are in charge of how we should discipline our life. And two of those disciplines were fasting and keeping the Sabbath. And um, the way that you know. Uh, Many of the Jewish interpreters of the law understood things like fasting and Sabbath was that um, they, lost, they lost sight of this, but it began with an understanding, theological understanding, that fasting and Sabbath were means by which we were participating in what God had called us to do, and we were participating in anticipation of Messiah's coming. So not only did we uh, fast because 
uh, we were instructed to, um, and, and there was lots of interpretation as to how often a person should fast, and there in, um, I think it's Zephaniah where, or Zechariah, where it's you know, the, um, there are four fasts that are suggested, and there are other places where two fasts were recommended per week, four fasts per week, two fasts per week. Um, <clears throat> but that uh, fasting was not only the opportunity to humble oneself and, uh, and repent, but it was also a means by which one anticipated and actually prepared for the coming of Messiah. Same thing with the Sabbath. The Sabbath was um, a gift given to the people of God. And that's an interesting thing that maybe has been lost along the way, this idea of Sabbath as gift. That the Sabbath was a gift given in two pivotal moments of the people of God. The first moment was in creation. That God rested on the seventh day. So in creation, God gives to God's people the gift of Sabbath. And in deliverance, God gives to the people of Israel as they are being rescued from their bondage in Egypt. They are brought to the Mount Sinai in the middle of the wilderness where the law is presented. And in the law, the law says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Why? Because God needs us to do that? No, it is to remember that we have been delivered from bondage. That Sabbath is a discipline of freedom. And, that, uh, and that, that's why, and we'll get into this next time, that's why it was such a controversial thing because it was such an, an important gift that God was giving us. And we have to find the right way to receive God's gift. The gift given to us in creation and the gift given to us in deliverance from bondage. God, this is a precious gift. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And it's one of the Ten Commandments because God wants to give us this precious gift of rest. And, but not just rest because, you know, oh, my, I'm so tired. I've had such a busy week. I'm going to take the day off. Not at all. Rest in order to show and to live in our freedom from the bondage we might have to all the other things that are claiming our time. Right? It is an act of um, resistance to the world when we participate in Sabbath. It is an act of resistance to the world when we fast. Because we are saying... There is something more important than what the demands of the culture around me are um, expecting of me. So that's the background when we get, we'll get into the exchanges in these two stories and, and some other things. But um, it's something to reflect on when you think about our own discipline and what is, how does, does fasting fit into our life? Um, does uh, Sabbath fit into our life, and if so, how? It's an interesting thing for us to consider. Um, and I'll come back to how scandalous all this is when we uh, take another look at it at the, um, at the beginning of next time. So, uh, it's 7.28 and 42 seconds. Um, so it says that clock back there. Um, any quick comments or questions uh, from anybody about what we've covered? It's not a fair way to ask that. They have quick comments or questions. Oh, whoa, we got one over here. Steve? So my question is... Wait, we gotta, gotta, we got to get a microphone. Because our online community can't hear this wise question that's coming from you. So wise. Um, question is... At the time, wasn't sickness considered a result of sin? So there was sort of a pre-knowledge or a, a, an assumption that there, if someone was sick with uh, leprosy, let's say they had some sort of sin that needed to be removed. 
Great question. Thank you for that. And you're right. Um, there was a, and, and come Sunday, because I'm going to preach a little bit about that. This is a shameless plug for <laughs> coming on Sunday. So um, I know you'll be on, you know, on the edge of your seat listening for, for the answers to this question. But yes, there was a theology baked into Judaism, and it's still around even today, which says that um, you deserve what you get. You deserve what you get. So if you're sick, something, there's something wrong in you that resulted in this. If you are rich, man, you must be in God's favor. Because look at you. Uh, so there was this really kind of warped theology that, that you know, sort of, and, and what it did is it, it helped people to feel good about these divisions that they created. Like, well, I don't, I don't need to have anything to do with that leper because <laughs> he got what he deserved. You know, you know, you're, you're, you, know you are what you are, and that's, that's life, so we'll put you in a leper colony. So... Um, and, and it made the righteous, it gave justification for, the, for bad behavior, right? Um, and I think spiritually there's always that thing that we've got going on. This is that, what this forgiveness of sins thing means. This forgiveness of sins is to liberate us from that, that, um, that brokenness in us that somehow wants to keep thinking that uh, this has happened it must have been because of this I did. It must have been because of who I am. It must be, you know, da, 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 that somehow this made this happen. And, and, and it's not to say that we don't mess up and cause a lot of our own, you know, brokenness. I mean, we, we certainly, you know, I, I've done some dumb things and I've paid dearly for them. But... Um, but that's not because God wanted that to happen. That's not because, well, okay, McConnell, you slipped up. Ha <laughs> ha. We'll see what happens to you, pal. Um, that's, bad. that's, I think, bad and broken theology um, because it's really not God that's a part of that. It's just the result of, you know, um, the consequences of our lives. Um, and, and that's what Jesus is kind of liberating people from. It's like, you know, it doesn't matter. This paralyzed guy... You may think it's, he deserves it, but that's not it at all. Stand up, your sins are forgiven. I'm raising you to a new life. Um, and you can put all that behind you. So, uh, one, more. one more question. Thank you. And also, places in the heart is, you can find it on Netflix. Greg over there, discover that. Ah, places in the heart, find it on Netflix. And um, I get a dollar for every view, so. <laughs> Yeah, Bob. Uh, Steve, when I listened to your uh, presentation the first week, I got the feeling that Mark was gathering stories and recording them after they had happened. And I got to thinking about that in the sense that, you know, if I were Mark, I would be putting down just the absolute facts this happened and that happened. But there are so many nuances in this story that it makes you believe that God is somehow guiding his word and protecting it, and then you go through all the various translations that we've had. Just make a couple comments about how does God protect his word so that we have something authentic we can trust? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, going back to last year when we talked about the nature of the Bible, I think what's what's... I, what I believe is really at work here is the, is the work of the Holy Spirit that is seeking to use our human, the human vessel of language, translation, um, oral tradition, um, people like Mark putting together a story. Um, I, I believe very much so that the, the Holy Spirit is at work there and often in ways we can't quite even imagine. Right? That we, what, I think sometimes what we want the Bible to be is something that we think it needs to be in order for it to be God's word. Well, that's not up to us. 
it's up to God to make it God's word in the way that God wishes to make it God's word. And a lot of that has to do with the work of the Holy Spirit to, to bring that word forward to us. So like we were, I said at the beginning, we're all reading from different translations of the Bible. And you know, one person could read one verse that's translated this way. Another person could read another verse that's translated this way. And, uh, and for whatever reason, this person reads you know, the language that's you know, translated this way. And the Holy Spirit just, yeah, one of those words jumps out. It's like, whoa, I never thought of it that way. You know, that's, that's amazing. Uh, and all of a sudden, something's going on inside a person because somehow the Holy Spirit's been at work through that. Um, and had that person read a different translation, what's that mean? That, that word's not in that translation. What does that mean? Does that mean that, you know, well, that doesn't mean it's not the God's word? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that the Holy Spirit works in ways that we can't comprehend, Right? I mean, I, I could tell you, you know, one of, I can, you know, here I go. Um, I could explain to you stories in the Bible that at, at a certain time when I've read the story, a story that I've read a hundred times before, and I've read the story, and it's like, I never saw that. And, and I feel like I'm being spoken to. I feel like I'm being summoned. I feel like God is trying to address me in some way. And, and, I, and I can't explain it, but I believe that somehow the Holy Spirit is at work in that. I could pass that story over to the next person and say, read the story. And they'll read the story and say, yeah, whatever. And I'll say, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're supposed to have the same experience with this story as I am. And I say, well... You know, it's a nice story, but it doesn't speak to me. And that, I have to surrender that to the work of the Holy Spirit, right? To say, well, for some reason I was encountered by that word. And it's not unlike Peter and Andrew and James and John and Levi, whom Jesus walks up to one day out of the middle of nowhere and says, follow me. And they're following. It's like, well, how do you explain that? I mean, poor Zebedee, the father of James and John, he's, he's not, he, didn't, he didn't follow. He's back in the boat. Jeez, I got you know, to keep fishing. You know? but, but somehow these five are encountered, and they're called, and they're summoned. Well, I think that's what the, that's what the, the Bible does. And um, so, yeah, so thank you for that question. I think... It's very germane to what we're looking at here in the first couple of chapters of Mark. So, All right, let me pray for us. Thank you, O oh God. Um, we're grateful for your word and for the ways by which perhaps we have been encountered by it over our years or maybe even now. We pray that you will continue to keep us um, hungry for what it is that you may have to say to us as we seek to live out our lives with you. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.